scratching an itch, and that's great, you know, scratching your own itch, but then if you want to share it with others, then sometimes you start to realize other people don't think about things the same way you do. And that's where my kind of group comes in, the experience group. So what I want to talk about is, is fail early or fail large means doing some testing in the beginning before you want to share things with somebody else can save you a lot of heartache later on. Uh, so how many uh, people remember this? It's kind of an old, okay, yeah, an, an old example, but there's a reason. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you in advance, I'm going to mix my metaphors a little bit. I worked for Lockheed, so I feel like I can use Lockheed examples. So, you know, if you say, what does software have to do with some of these things? Well, just uh, I'm broadly applying a metaphor. Also, it, it helps sometimes to step back and look from a different perspective. So the Mars Climate Orbiter was a, a fail in that uh, it crashed into Mars, got all the way to Mars, but then crashed. And the, the root cause analysis found that different teams were working on different units. It was, uh, one team was using metric, another was using imperial. It didn't convert one way or the other so that they matched up. So nobody found the problem in advance. And that's what I want to talk about, is finding problems in advance before they become disasters, okay? Now, I didn't work on that Lockheed project. I was very happy that I didn't work on that massive failure. This is one that I did work on. Uh, the division of Lockheed that I worked for uh, built the transmission system and the turret stabilization system. Is anybody familiar with the Bradley fighting vehicle at all, know what it is? looks kind of like maybe a tank. It's not a tank. It's an infantry vehicle. It's made to carry troops into the field. It's not heavily armored. It doesn't have a big tank gun. Its defense is speed, and its offense is to be able to fire at speed because it's got a stabilized turret. So as it's charging over hill and dale, the gun is stable on its target. And I realize I'm like pointing at somebody, like, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so. But this is Linux, Linux Fest, you know, this is itself, we like, our, um, we like our, our things that go bang, right? So if we have time at the end, we'll talk about that a little bit more. So that's a project that I did work on, okay? And I found a problem. Now, that was my job. I was in um, quality assurance. I was a QA engineer. And, I, and when I say big-ish, I mean, I found something that could have become a disaster except that I found it. And actually, this is where software comes into play a little bit. A lot of electronic testing is done through software-driven uh, testing. I was reviewing the program code and saying, hey, the specification in here in the program code doesn't match the specification you're supposed to be testing to. So I was very proud of myself, very happy with myself. I did my job really well. So how come everybody was unhappy with me? I slowed down production, I had killed the budget, the, I'd put the vendor on report. You know, everybody was unhappy with me because I did my job. Now, I think that's partly because um, really it wasn't that whether or not I did my job, it's like planning didn't do their job to plan in time for testing, plan in time for failures and iteration and improvement and so on. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But another aspect is that people like positive results. It's all unicorns and rainbows and everybody's happy. Everybody likes good news. Nobody likes bad news, okay? And in my office, I have this chart, the Cognitive Bias Codex. And this is like 180, and you're not meant to be able to read that. Don't worry about that. It's, it's meant to show you that there are so many biases that we have, and bias, um, can be a good word or it could be a bad word. The reason that we can function as human beings is because we are pattern-seeking and pattern-recognizing animals. We automate so much of our processing that we can get through the day quickly, as opposed to having to think through everything from scratch every time. The bad part of that is sometimes we fool ourselves um, with some of the patterns that we use. And one of the most common ones is confirmation bias, okay? And we're, we're all pretty much familiar with that terminology. Um, this is where we overvalue data that supports what we already believe 
and we undervalue data that disagrees with us, okay? So you end up with situations like this, where you have a designer talking to a product owner or, or a user or something like that, saying, how much do you love this thing I built? You know, it's prejudicing uh, the answer when you ask questions in that way. And that's why we never want um, developers, product owners, designers, things like that, being involved whatsoever in testing. Um, and, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Whenever I've built something, I, I like a pat on the back just as much as anybody else, right? Um, you need an unbiased approach to gathering feedback. So the point that, you know, they always say you should summarize your presentation into one takeaway. If there's nothing you take away today, it's like negative results can save a project if you find them early enough, okay? That's very important. How many of you have been involved in a project that was a disaster, right? Okay, how many of you made a warning yourself, knew that a warning had been given, knew that there were indicators that there were gonna be problems, and they were ignored? Yeah, okay, so you, we all know this intuitively, but it is hard, and we're gonna talk a little bit about how that's hard in some ways. And also, systematically going about getting that kind of feedback that can help. So in, in the software world, even if you're not in, in uh, design or user experience, you know about the phrase UX, right? We talk a lot about user experience, UXR, user experience research, UXD, design, and so on. So we're familiar with that terminology and what they do. And that's very often testing the interface. Can we understand the logic flow, the workflow, the, the labels used in the navigation, things like that, okay? We, what we don't talk about as much is testing the validity of the value proposition. So I wanna go over two examples, one of each, and talk about how, how they can be very important. So uh, the case study first to go over is how to design and validate a, a user interface, and this could be an entire course and a long talk. I'm gonna show some kind of information dense slides, don't worry, I don't necessarily intend for you to absorb all the material there. So we're gonna go over, uh, this is for a pharmacy school redesign, okay, uh, university. You're targeting a young audience. Um, a lot of people think a tech savvy audience is kind of what we think of immediately about millennials, uh, or even younger than millennials, I don't know what the next generation after that is called. Um, but really, they are so inundated with online systems and digital interfaces that they jump to pattern rec recognition faster than many of us who are older. So they are prone to failure if the system does not behave as they expect it to behave. So it's actually more important to design properly for somebody who's facing that kind of saturation. So the kinds of research questions we wanted to ask in this case, this is for a website, not an application. It was like, how do, how do people group topics? What's their mental model for that? How do you label things so that they understand it and the terminology they use think, you know, in terms of medical care? People who uh, in this room would typically think of cancer, you know, whereas medical students think in terms of oncology, right? They're referring to the same thing, but different terminology. Um, and design usability, and I'm gonna back up. You would not believe how many times if you let people, let professionals write the content, design the interface and stuff like that, they'll use the professional jargon that their users won't understand necessarily. So the research methods we use to do that are things called card sorts, and you can just think of index cards on a table. I mean, we literally run them that way sometimes where you put out a bunch of cards and ask people to group them in ways that make sense to them. There's online ways to do that. We'll talk about that. Um, tree testing is how you see how well that worked. You ask people to follow a tree, a navigation tree to, to um, well you, you ask them to perform a task and you see which tree branchings they take. And then a usability test just in terms of all kinds of aspects of where do they, where do they go with the mouse? Where, where do they look on the screen? Those kinds of things. So a card sort, I guess, uh, <laughs> that's not meant to be blacking out the face for privacy, that's just lack of contrast or whatever on the screen. So that's a moderated uh, online session, that's actually me up there doing this test with this person. So this is what we call a 
generative activity. Uh, you're not going to find failures here. This is where you are generating information about how people think. Um, and we give them an online interface. These are basically cards, and they group them into categories, and they name categories and things like that. So you are seeing how they think, how they think things go together. Um, I had a client one time that uh, we were working with them, and he said, well, why do we need to do this? And I explained to him to understand how people think about your product. I know how people think about our products. We, we built this industry. This industry didn't exist for 40 years. We've been telling people how to think about this. And later the data showed him he was labeling something as personal care, and people were searching on hygiene. You know? So he may have done this, set this up 40 years ago, but the people have moved on without him. Um, so we found that our participants in this study kind of grouped things together into similar categories. And again, this isn't really to, to tell you about this particular case. You don't really care about this school of pharmacy or to become experts um, in testing. It's, I'm building to a point. So they were thinking along the same ways so far, which is good. It makes it easier for you. You don't have to get really, really creative and imaginative. So the results were that we could plan logical sections using the card sort and produce the first draft of a website structure. So there were no real negative results here because this was generative research, not evaluative, not seeing how well people performed to it. But once we have that first draft of a new site structure, then you can do the tree test. That's where um, you design some tasks. You say, okay, we want you to find this piece of information. We want you to register for this event or something like that. And we might have a, a mock-up, a clickable mock-up, and see how they go through the system. And in this case, we had like 68 participants took a five-minute test. And the nice thing is, I probably don't mention this enough, this is before a single line of code is written because writing program code is expensive, you know, very labor-intensive. Uh, some of these tests can be pretty quick and easy, and you find things before you have to fix them. If you went to the talk next door where he was building his, his small home, you know, after you've built something, changing it is much harder than building it correctly in the first place, and we all know that. Now, this is where you can start finding things going wrong. So this is a case, this is a real one. I'm, I didn't show you all the, the positive ones. Uh, the general results were very good, you know, great, good job us, right, designing one. But that's what you hope for, right? But you need to pay attention to the ones that go wrong. In this case, we had like a 54% failure rate. They could not find what the task had asked them to find. 34% had a partial success. Partial success mean, means that they needed some assistance um, where we had built in some, some contextual help or, or other guideposts along the way. Uh, so most users struggled to find this target link for this task. And so we came up with a recommendation to increase the visibility of this particular topic and how to get there. So the results were that it validated most of the card sort. However, we did find a few uh, task failures. So that, but that's okay, because that allowed us to correct this before we'd written any code. Actually, um, before finalizing the design. So then we went through the design process, and then you get to usability testing. That's nice when you've got high fidelity mockups. It looks exactly like the web screen, the web page is going to look. It just it's not functional. You can do some image map, you know, clicking for click testing, but um, no code. So this was a test we came up for them. We were doing live remote sessions using Google Meet. Um, and it was moderated, meaning we had one of my, me or one of my researchers working with them, listening to them. And the test design was that there's several steps here. So that we were doing that kind of first impressions, kind of just tell us what does this page look like to you? What are the words that come to mind? And then we had the four specific tasks we asked them to do. Then we had a, a little quick survey after each task about was this easy, was this hard? You've seen these kinds of things on web pages. Right, did this page help you find the information you were looking for? Those kinds of things. And then we had one post-test survey with some broader questions, a little, little bit longer survey. 
and then one post-test interview where the moderator was asking questions and kind of having an interactive discussion. So this allowed us to get qualitative information as well as quantitative. So this was a well-structured research method. We got a lot of information here, a long report. And so, um, you know, in our reports, we list out the number of participants and which groups they were in, which tasks they performed, that kind of stuff. Um, and we define the tasks. This is where I said we aren't gonna go through all the details. Uh, this is an example of the success and failure rate and then the results of the post-task questionnaire. And that was one, an example of one where we got a lot of very positive results. Great, yeah, again, good job us, that's what, what we hoped for. But we did have some failures in group two. So here's another case where, oops, our assumptions that we made regarding their behavior went wrong. And this is where, you know, this happens to all of us. We can't test what we build because we know how it's supposed to work because we built it the way we think it should work, right? Um, I'm gonna, does anybody here work for, for Red Hat? No, so I can tell a story on Red Hat? Okay, they're one of our clients. So they built um, Red Hat Connect, if anybody knows that. Um, so it's a way to, if you're building containers, to have it certified through their system. And it was kind of a portal so that you could log in and submit your, your container and go through the certification process. The workflow was so contorted that when somebody registered for Red Hat Connect, they had a Red Hat engineer call them and walk them through it because users couldn't figure out the path through it by themselves. And they brought us in to help them get through that. Okay, now Red Hat's a big company made a lot of money figuring out how to build software to help people and still, you know, get wrapped up in their own mindset and didn't understand how users would approach that workflow. So it can happen. It's, it's not a criticism. That's why you need kind of an objective, third-party, structured approach to finding these kinds of things. And so the ratings on the questionnaire were, were lower, as you would expect. And so, again, you don't need to read all these bullet points. The point is that we had a lot of takeaways. These were the validations, like, again, hey, yay yeah, us, we did a good job. We saw, we expected this behavior, we saw that behavior. But then there were takeaways that, of things that were problems, of behaviors that we found that were not as anticipated, where people were getting lost, and so on. So the results were that we did identify clear needs for development, or for improvement. But again, this was before uh, changes could be made before any code was written. We had completed the design, so all we had to change was the design. Then we could hand it over to the front-end developers, the back-end developers, to write the software. So that's what we usually think of, testing the interface. How will people use our system? Okay. But I would say that's not enough. I mean, that's great. Yes, that's, that's wonderful. Um, that works really well for an existing product and even for a new product, but for a new product, there's an additional thing you need to test. Is like, do people really want this thing? When you're producing something new, you're offering them a value proposition. You're making an assumption that they have a problem and that you're providing a solution to their problem that will work for them, okay? And that's a very important thing to test. Um, again, back in my Lockheed days, I had uh, I worked for a quality director who I loved this. He said, "A bad idea, beautifully executed, is still a bad idea." Okay, so you can do all that user testing on the screen in terms of can you follow the path and do they know where to click and can they follow the workflow and all that stuff. But that says nothing about do they want to? Do they have a reason to? Does it solve their problem? So this is the second big. Uh, Thing that, that I think everybody should test. So in this case study, um, uh, we work with North Carolina State University. I'm in Raleigh, so they're very convenient to us. And they have a problem with it. So they're a major university. I think they're up to, what, 34, 35,000 students, something like that. A lot of classes, a lot of topics. Um, does everybody here know what a syllabus is? It's like the summary of the course. It lists what you're going to cover, prerequisites, materials needed, labs, 
all that. And the thing is, they vary greatly between computer science courses and engineering courses to humanities and language and, and uh, textiles and art and design and just different classes have very, very different approaches. And the, um, the faculty have different ways that they want to create their, their syllabi. But there are also accreditation body requirements. Uh, you must have these minimum uh, piece standards you must meet for information provided in the syllabus. And it's changed and evolved over the years. And there are some professors that created their syllabus 10 years ago and haven't changed it. So the university wanted to achieve business goals that we found were in conflict with long established user behaviors. How many of us here know the phrase, somebody moved my cheese, All right? Back to the, uh, well, for those who haven't heard of this, uh, referring to the, the cheese at the end of the maze, it's the incentive for the mice to get through the maze. Um, it's back to the point about us being pattern-seeking animals. We learn a pattern, we're comfortable with that pattern, we can work efficiently because we know that pattern and we don't have to think about it until somebody forces us to change that pattern, okay? And that's what is, going to have to happen here. So the stakeholders, in terms of doing the stakeholder interviews, they, they needed to reflect up-to-date requirements, to back to the accreditation body requirements. Um, they needed a flexible system that could re, uh, respond to changes with very little back-end updates. And they wanted the display to be more modern and responsive, you know, those kinds of design terms we hear now. Web designers know what responsive is, non-web designers have a different meaning for responsive, okay? And then, but also, you needed to allow for rollover of syllabi from previous semesters to allow people to get started, stop, pick it back up in an intelligent way, to be flexible for the needs of all the different departments, to provide clear directions and feedback on how to create them, and to be able to integrate with their course inventory management system. And oh, by the way, the stakeholders made it very, very clear that said, they said, you know, you think students are bad at procrastinating? Tell a, a professor to have a new syllabus ready for, you know, date X, and they will be doing it at, on X minus one. They'll be preparing it. Um, now, this, this was kind of a little red flag and a kind of a self-awareness. One of the stakeholders said, well, people have, may have said they want a modern and responsive system but do you really think they meant easy to use? Okay, now this, this he was very self-aware. I like this guy quite a lot. Um, I like all of them, they're a great team there. Um, Delta, I forget what the acronym stands for, something like distance education, learning, technology, something or other. Um, they provide a lot of these kinds of tools for the university. And um, he kind of nailed it. Do you think it, they meant easy to use? And it means easy for them, right? So the research questions, I mean, we wanted to test the interface and the workflow, the kind of normal things, but we also wanted to validate the value proposition. Would it make life easier for them? So we did the usual kinds of things we do, stakeholder interviews, focus groups. Uh, the thing that we different, did differently was a paper prototype. So I talked earlier about doing, um, building clickable mock-ups, right? And people, you've heard of wireframes and stuff like that. Well, an even quicker and easier method is to take pieces of paper and draw out the interface and say, and have post-it notes ready. Okay, you clicked on this button, now you've got a pop-up, smack down a post-it note, you know, stuff like that. It is a very quick, and what, the reason I keep saying that is because testing is expensive. It's like, I want a thing, I want to build the thing, and that costs enough money. Why should I spend extra money testing the ideas? I know what people need. So it's very hard to get money for testing in advance. So that's why we come up with these techniques to try and be as cheap and easy as, as possible so that you're not spending money writing code, then testing it and going back and reworking it. So paper prototyping is not so well known outside of UX and design circles, but it's, it's a great technique. We learned a lot doing paper prototyping with these um, faculty and staff. And so what we found was yeah, faculty are smart people. They were able to figure out and use the proposed interface, okay? 
but they strongly prefer to use their own tool sets, mostly Google Docs. Okay, so it comes back to, yeah, they can do it, but will they? Do they want to? So now this is a key thing here. The UX researcher, this was a member of my team, said, I was terrified to present the results. Okay. Now, how many of you have been scared to give your boss bad news? Okay. Well, she wasn't, I mean, I was her boss. Uh, I didn't mind her giving me bad news, but she knew she was going to have to present it to the client, the, so the ones who had paid us to do this work. Fortunately, like I said, these people um, really appreciate the value of, of testing. And they got that because the stakeholder said, if the faculty don't adopt the system, the project will fail. Well, that was kind of obvious. This will be directly related to both usability, yes, you know, it needs to be usable, and how we internally present the system. So that's kind of a simplistic way of saying organizational change management, which is another whole topic, whole course, whole book on that. But this was a test of the value proposition more so than the interface. So what are we going to do then um, if you know there's going to be resistance? So what we did was, and again, this isn't necessarily so crucial, we, we developed a service blueprint, which is just a fancy phrase for kind of mapping out the use process. And you kind of swim lane it in terms of what the user actions are, what the users need to perform. The front stage, meaning their interface, what they're working with. Backstage, meaning back, back in systems that, that feed that, that information and then support that's needed from various other team members that's not automated through systems. So we kind of went through that process. So as a result, we did a few things. We simplified the interface because we were forcing them to change workflow, so we decided we needed to change it as little as possible, so simplifying it. Importantly, we changed it from a big bang release so it's like, okay, here's your new tool, boom, go, to a phased release and set up an alpha test phase and an alpha test group to do that. So <laughs> you're going to get like graduate students to do uh, create the syllabi. But that's okay because what we're doing there is testing the interface, okay, and it's removing an irritant for the faculty. It's like, oh, I've got to do all this work, you know, to I've already got my syllabus created, why should I rekey it in? Okay, a student's going to do that. And the faculty will, will review it to see if it meets their needs and allows them to um, meet the new university requirements. Right. Um, so the alpha phase was successful. Um, we are still in the beta uh, software development right now. So this is in progress. Next year, maybe I can give you a report on, on how it worked out. But it, user research led to a leaner, lower risk approach. Instead of spending all the money and building a product and then finding out people don't use it, we did you know, quick cutting out pieces of paper and, and putting them in front of people to see how they responded to the ideas beforehand and then modified it. So you know what we, we can't look at alternate future timelines, right? This isn't a, a science fiction universe. Um, but we could have averted a disaster there. So what I want to say is that user experience uh, and design serves two masters, okay? We tend to focus on the users. That's what the phrase says, UX means user experience, right? But what we have to remember is that something is, somebody is providing that experience to them, okay? And we can't forget that half of the equation. Um, this uh, is a tool I use in workshops a lot where these two represent each half of that equation. So the right-hand side is the customer profile. We look at, first of all, what are the jobs they're trying to achieve, accomplish? What are their objectives? What tasks do they need to perform? What, what pain points do they have associated with doing that currently? What gains could we provide that they weren't even expecting? Uh, by the way, that's a, a pro tip. Most people think that gains are just removing the pain points. No, gains are giving them something extra that they weren't expecting. Okay. 
Um, and then we turn that into a list of products and services, or in software terms, if, uh, you know, features and functionality, things like that. Um, specifically addressing pain relievers and gain creators. Um, just a very simple example. Okay, you know, it takes a long time to create a syllabus. I typically can't do it in one session. And when I crash out of the current system, or when, not crash out, but when I stop working in the current system, I lose a lot of information because it's not saved. So we set up a system to better save that. Um, when I go to create a new course, I have to completely be start over again. Well, let's make it easier to kind of like import the, the previous semester and then modify as needed and things like that. Um, but I, well, I'm sorry, I went off on a little tangent. So we were talking about everything's in relation to a provider. The value proposition is crucial for a, a new product. For those of us who have been working on the same product for a long time, it can kind of be difficult to remember that. So we'll look at, let's look at who's providing that value. And you know, for me, it's important to remember they're typically the one paying our invoices or your paycheck or whatever your arrangement might be. So they are very often, it is rare that, that for many of us, it's rare that we're working for the directly for and with feedback from the end user. A lot of times it's through an intermediary through our company, through um, a marketing group, things like that. So this is a tool I use. Um, anybody uh, in here a business analyst? No? OK. I know there are a couple in the, in the seminar. I've talked to a couple. Um, so this is just kind of a, a way to, it's called the business model canvas. There's also a variant called the lean canvas. Um, and it's a way of kind of touching on all the key aspects of a business model. And you can summarize it in one page. And my clients love it when we go through a workshop and, and do this for them, because it's all in their head, but it's not really laid out nicely. And often we identify gaps in, in the model for entrepreneurs, because typically they get really, they love this, I've got this idea for a solution, but you haven't thought enough about the nuts and bolts, like, OK, what are you doing differently? What's your unfair advantage? Or what are your channels to the customers going to be? And things like that. So very important for this discussion is that it tends to be the top half of that chart is the user focus part. And the lower half is the provider focus in terms of defining our testing. And in terms of testing the value proposition, we have to remember, if the business model fails, the user gets nothing. And most of us can think of a few notable examples. You know. that, that slide will have to change every six months or something, you know, with the, with the latest story. Um, that one's already getting a little bit old, I guess. So if we're talking about the business model and the value proposition, well, you know, who sets those? And what does that mean for them? Now, if you're a, a software developer and you're scratching an itch and you want to see if it's got traction, well, that's great. You're setting the model. And if it's open source, it's a very simple business. <laughs> the, the business model is more like a distribution model. But for those who work in a business setting, it's more complex than that. So then you have a management structure and a larger organization, and things get complicated. And so this is the, uh, the results of a survey. So since I lead the you know, experience and research group, I read a lot of studies and things like that. I'd have to look I don't, at the speaker notes. I don't remember which one I got this from. Um, this was a survey of different groups. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, green is marketing, yellow is product management, blue is design and UX, light blue is market research and user research, and red is the executive level. And the question is, the statement is, we have a deep understanding of our customers' journeys across all touch points, online and offline. And it, it ranges from strongly disagree to strongly agree. You're all familiar with that scale, I'm sure. So look at the distribution for everybody except red. It kind of peaks in the, yeah, we kind of slightly agree, not in the extremes, you know, except for the executives. It's like, oh, yeah, we got this. I'm, I'm very sure that we understand our customers' journey. Really? OK. Let's ask the question in a different way. Um, our overall customer experience needs improvement. improvement. Now everybody's kind of jammed up against the strongly agree. Oh, yeah, we can improve this. Except for the executives. I mean, they still pretty much agree with that. But it does tail off more in terms of, well, I don't think we need to improve it as much as everybody else thinks. 
So, you know, this, this really reinforces that notion of bad news doesn't roll uphill. You know, nobody likes to give the boss bad news. Everybody likes positive results. Remember the unicorns and rainbows. Um, bad news gets filtered out, but that can save a project. So my, my calls to action from the talk would be to plan for testing and iteration. Okay, remember we talked before about that's, that's one of the reasons that nobody liked me was I had completely blown the production schedule. I had blown the budget because it was not planned for and scheduled for and budgeted for. Okay, so in, uh, actually that was manufacturing, but still in, in software development it's the same thing. Um, plan for time for testing and for remediation of what you find in testing. It's, it's, it seems to me ridiculous, but it happens very often where you'll see a development team, uh, a project that they planned for testing, but they didn't plan any time for fixing things that testing found. Then why test? You know, I mean, well, okay, I'm not going to go that far, but you know what I mean. Um, if you don't plan for failure, failure will happen unplanned, which is what most of us experience. Smile and don't groan at test fails, okay? You just learn something valuable. And that can be really hard if you are the developer, you are the designer, you are on, so my team, you know, user experience and, and, and um, research and design and information architecture, this happens to us all the time. I guess maybe we're used to it because we know, you know, we, <laughs> we, we joke about making stuff up, but in an informed fashion, you know, because, um, and this is true for many of us, I know we're not that special, where you can get all kinds of inputs and data and all that, but at some point it means a professional has to go into a room and shut the door and take all those inputs and use a mix of art and science to come up with what they think will work best, okay? We just have to do that more than, than other people a lot of times. So we get feedback that we were wrong on a regular basis, okay? People who aren't used to that can have a really hard time accepting that news that, no, 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 this thing that you think is brilliant, it's not working for people. And actually, that's one of the great things about doing testing is because instead of, it, it changes it from a, me versus you conversation about I think you, you know, designed this poorly or whatever. It's like, hey, it's not me. Look at these people struggling with it in the videos and things like that. Videos are fantastic. There's nothing better to show a client or a product manager or something like that is a video of somebody struggling with their brilliant concept. Video is fantastic. <laughs> so take negative feedback to heart. If it's hard to hear, you really need to listen. If you find yourself kind of starting to object, that's when you need to like take a breath and listen to what they're telling you. Um, think about your value to clients as much as to users. So this may be a little bit more important for me since I work in an agency model. I don't work for a, a product company, product development or company like many of you do. So. Um, because, yes, we want a fantastic experience for the users, but they're not the ones with uh, money in the game. It's the company that's paying to develop it. So think about the value to them as well. So now I, wanna, I thought I'd go back and see, do you remember when I said I found a problem in the Bradley fighting vehicle? You want to see how that turned out? So this is, let's see if this will work. So this, this is a video, uh, let me pause it. So this is a video of a demonstration. It's, you know, you see a little grandstand there with some, some army folks and stuff like that. This is a demonstration of the Bradleys. And what they're doing, you'll hear a little, lot of little pop, 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 pops. If, if we've got nothing but my speakers here, you won't hear anything at all. Um, they're firing as they're moving, and a little bit into it, you'll see what they're firing at. And this demonstrates their ability to fire while moving, which was their key value proposition, right? Their defense is to be able to keep moving at speed, and their offense is to be able to keep firing. Now watch, the turret, stay, turret is stable on target while the body is spinning underneath it. It's a little gun. 
Um, so it doesn't ex fire an explosive round. It, it fires a depleted uranium slug, which are really, really heavy at high velocity. So the kinetic energy just turns it into a molten mass when it hits the, the enemy vehicle. Um, yeah, okay, now, now it's just boring after that. The, uh, um, so, oh, wait a minute. How do I get to the next slide? I have to escape out of the video or something? User fail. Okay. I'll just reload and I will get back to my. <laughs> okay, so the results, the combat results. So the Bradley fighting vehicle crews were so happy, they came to our uh, plant to tell us their stories. So what happens was, uh, this was in, I forget, the first Gulf War. Um, they were faster than the M1, A1, Abrams main battle tank. So they were able to go faster than the tanks. And they encountered the enemy tanks, and, and they were older Soviet T-34s that the Iranians had. So basically, they were literally able to run circles around them and pound rounds into them and destroy them. And the tank guys were really upset, because when they got there, there was nothing for them to do. <laughs> you know. So um, that's what we all want, is for the thing that we are working on for the users to come back and say, you know what, it for performed beautifully, and it allowed me to do more than I expected to be able to do. Okay, so the way to do that is to, to I mean, yes, it, it takes good design, but to test beforehand. So that's all I have. Um, I'm happy to answer questions, if anybody's got any questions about that. I appreciate you coming. I realize this is a very technology-heavy conference. I didn't expect a, a large audience. I'm pleased with the, the turnout, so thank you. I love making software better. Yes? Well, I'm just curious, what was the tech you found at that event? So, oh gosh, this is, okay, now you're making me feel old. This is like over 20 years ago. So. Um, the, the way to get precise and rapid control is through digital devices as opposed to analog devices. Everybody here gets that, right? But um, drives for big, heavy steel turrets, or actually those were machined aluminum, uh, if I remember correctly, um, are basically analog devices, okay? So the way to make that transition was we had a, a power converter, um, um, very high current power converter, that um, was, uh, as with a lot of military things, was like operating on the edge of what was possible. And when you're pushing the edge, uh, you have to, to be very careful in your testing. So what was funny was that was, you know, people think about quality control and they hear about um, auto manufacturing where you're making thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of vehicles. I mean, that's why I drive an F-150 pickup. It's because there's a million on the road. It's easy to get parts and get it worked on and stuff like that, or to watch a YouTube video to fix something yourself, like, like I recently did. Um, for those, the production run was hundreds. So um, testing is a little, you can't quite get those statistics of, of large numbers. For the satellite, that was really funny. Um, so I did work with one of our uh, satellite divisions you're making something that flies into space, you're making two, you know, one that you can test destructively and one that's gonna fly. <laughs> maybe a little bit of an exaggeration, maybe you make three or four. Um, and you do destructive testing there. It's like, okay, well, this one broke at that voltage, you know, so we're gonna take it down a little bit. Um, so it was, uh, the problem that I found was in that um, power converter, um, and the control system associated with it. I hope that helps. It's kind of a vague answer, but it's a long time ago. I don't know. <laughs> Did somebody else have a question over here? Yes. Yeah.
those, those pressures um, shall not, uh, are, you know, don't take that lightly. Um, so I am a, a great example of, hmm? Right. So I, I'm going to give an example, a personal example here. So what, what's the phrase, the Peter principle, you rise to the level of your incompetence or something like it? Um, maybe, it, oh, that doesn't sound good on me. But so I, in my career path, I mean, I'm a gray hair. I rose to a certain level where I was not enjoying life, okay? And then I took a career break and came back to doing something that was fun. And in that position, I was told one time, you know, um, well, I look forward to your analysis that's going to confirm this. And I said, well, what if my analysis doesn't confirm that? And he said, and this executive looking at me, I am confident your analysis will show this is correct. So um, I left that company, and I'm, I, this is one that I have not named, you know, and it wasn't on my slide deck. Um, um, the CFO I was working for was indicted on fraud a year after I left. So I am proud. <laughs> that I did not see myself as a fit for that corporate culture. <laughs> did somebody else have? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I was, yeah. My, my, oh, my background varied. Um, so I went to North Carolina State University, got a degree in physics, yeah. Well, that wasn't a thing when I was there. I came back to Raleigh and people were doing that. It's like, what is this? You got a little twitch here. And um, so I graduated in 81. I got, I like to say uh, that I got kicked. This is very relevant to the talk and we've got time so I can tell stories. <laughs> if you get bored, you can leave. Um, I got kicked out of electrical engineering. So I, I thought, well, what am I gonna do? Electrical engineering looks like fun. And I had a really good advisor. He pulled me out in an, into his office one day after class and he said, you know, you're being a disruption in class. I said, what do you mean? I'm, 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 a t I'm paying attention, I'm asking questions. He said, that's just it. You keep asking why questions. Engineers are all, all about how to do things. Like they'd say, okay, in, in one of these other talks, somebody mentioned a Fourier series analysis. And um, I would say, why do you use a Fourier series analysis to solve this problem? Because it works. Yeah, but why does it work? It's like, okay. The rest of these guys have finished building this thing, and you're asking why. So he recommended I go into physics, and I was, he was right. I was much happier in physics. Um, in an engineering thermo course, thermodynamics, you would start off with the ideal gas law and do calculations. In my class, um, we started with more fundamental principles, and my final exam was one question. Let's see if I can get this right now. Um, you, you've been living in a universe where the spin of is it fermions or bosons? I forget which is plus or minus one half. Now our universe where it's plus or minus one third, what is the ideal gas law in this universe? <laughs> and after, after sweating massively for a while, I settled down and got it right. But you know that is why I do this kind of work now, is because I'm the ask why kind of guy. Um, but oh, to finish answering your question, you can cut me off whenever, what's my background? So I, I did that and that was fun. It's like woohoo, fun, physics. So how do you get a job with physics? And I was out of money, so I only got a bachelor's degree in, with an undergrad degree in physics. So I went to the nuclear navy, which was great. It was um, taking all this theoretical knowledge I had and turning it into real knowledge of how to operate a reactor safely at sea with a tube full of you know, nuclear warheads and pressurized hydraulics and stuff like that. Um, that was great fun. Then where do you go from the military? You go to work for a defense contractor and play with all the whiz bang technology. I was in supplier quality assurance. I started off in their engineering, went to supplier quality assurance, which meant I got to go to all our suppliers and see all the whiz bang technology they were making for us. That was, that was way cool. That was good life. I was, well, no, in the eighties. So I got out in 87. Yeah, I was in uh, Comsubron 18 and in, the, uh, in Goose Creek and the uh, Naval Shipyard in Charleston. Ah, okay. So, so I worked in the Naval Shipyard at Charleston and then Submarine Squadron 18 in the floating, the ARDM, floating dry dock up there and went to sea to qualify. It was 
you know, and stuff like that. It's fun. I qualified on the same labor and said, uh, I picked off the wrong piece of metal. The whole thing. I picked the right piece up. I was USS Nathan Hale, <laughs> which, which <laughs> reminds me of our bumper sticker, which I can't tell in a mixed crowd, so I won't do that. Um, okay. Um, I, yes. Well, it, I would say neither one because the videos will be of people taking a test, a usability test. So it's not me telling a story, so it's not me presenting data or me telling an anecdote. It's watching users um, try to use their product, their software, something like that. So thank you for the clarification. Does that, does that help? Yeah. So, so again, it, rem it, it removes that argument about I am telling you. Um, that your product failed, it's like the users can't figure it out, you know? So it really helps shoot down a lot of arguments. Um, so what, um, let me go back up here. So if you look at this one, at the test method, the, the test design, there was a first impression task. It's like, what are your feelings about this? Then we had some tasks for them to perform. We watched them perform the task. We asked them a question about it afterward. And then we had a survey after all of the tasks. Um, so it was a combination of what they did, what we observed, um, which is kind of anecdotal in terms of, well, they didn't say this, but I noticed they paused or hesitated here. Or, and, and we measure things like time on task. You know, how long, if it took longer to perform this one than that one, then maybe the first one wasn't as clear, things like that. So uh, there's a lot of things that we're looking at in a well-designed test. And so like that, the top right corner there, um, it, it really depends on the test that we're performing how you can record it. Um, but yeah, audio and video recordings are great. So what we will do is we, of course, do a summary report. And you just saw some excerpts of those. They tend to, to be very long and boring unless you're intensely interested in that product. Um, and then to have video evidence to back up what you're saying. You know, so when you say people were really confused about this, they can say, yeah, yeah, you just don't like that, you know. But then you show a video of somebody just completely stuck and lost. <laughs> it makes the point. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yep. Yes. Any UX, what about? No, I have not. Yeah. And you know, come think of it, I have not either. Um, that's. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And yeah, and, and many of us can think of a, uh, commands where the the name of the command is is quirky. You know, just it, it tickled the fancy of the person who created it, as opposed to a lot of what we do is label testing. Is will somebody understand what this does based on what you're calling it? You know, so that would be one thing we could do there. Um, you know, a lot of times we look for places that need contextual help. That might be harder to do in the limited interface there, but in terms of structuring the demand pages, things like that could be useful because we all love to do documentation.
Yep. Yep. That, that's an excellent point. Um, stick to the standards. Standards are standards for a reason. That's the default behavior that people who, who that's, that's what they'll go to. And it's just even more frustrating if they go to, you know, dash H and, and don't get an answer. Not only did they not get their answer, but now they're just ticked off because yet another thing didn't work for them. <laughs> so yeah, start with standards. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. I do not know if such a thing exists. I have not seen it. I've not been asked to do any kind of testing like that, but that's a very interesting question. So we got three minutes left for any other interesting questions. Yes, yes. Um, so no, no, that, that, that's very important because as, as, uh, as the slide said, I had a, a staffer who was terrified to present the results. So you never just say, yeah, this, this part of your design or this part of your thing is terrible. You don't, you don't lead with that. You lead with, this is what we were testing. Ideally, you would have a design hypothesis to begin with. You know, the hypothesis is of the form of, we believe that if we provide this, to that user who's trying to do this thing, we will observe these results, right? Um, and so we start with, when I talk about these long detailed reports, we start off with what were we trying to test? What was the methodology that we used? Um, what did we see? And then an analysis of what we, you know, okay, we took all this that we saw and applied thought process to it this is what we find as the results, and then we make these recommendations based upon it. That's the other thing, is you never tell anybody, well, this is bad, you explain why it's bad and what could be done to improve it. Does that help answer the question? Yeah. Yeah, we never lead with the bad news. We lead with, what were we trying to find out? How did we try to find it out? What do we observe? What does our analysis show about that? And now the bad news is, we need to change this thing. <laughs> and here's how to change it. Anything else? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the overall project, including code, we're in beta development of the code right now. Yeah. Well, that's a good that's a good point. Yes, we yeah. Instead of being an alpha release of the code, you're right. For us, that was like an alpha. Uh, of the concept, you know. We're, we're releasing this concept to people in this version, seeing how they respond to it, as opposed to releasing a, a defined code uh, release. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Um, well, so we were a bunch of engineers. Uh, we didn't, we don't know military tactics and 